Over the course of the past year, I have subjected myself to a lot of movies and TV shows that are among the worst audiovisual media ever produced by humanity. And having suffered through all four episodes of Netflix's historical distortionist propaganda docudrama, Queen Cleopatra, I can say with confidence that this show is without doubt the most disgusting, disgraceful, evil-intentioned, vicious thing that I have ever seen. It is not just historically inaccurate, it is an all-out assault on history that knowingly lies about Roman, Egyptian, African and European history, distorts it, blackwashes it, then accuses every historian ever to have studied Cleopatra of committing the very crime it has just spent nearly four hours engaged in. She was an African queen, and that's a fact that's been buried, erased, whitewashed. The shamelessness of this show's hypocrisy is astounding, even by the non-standards of woke Hollywood. The producers of this show push Cleopatra's story through the twisted entrails of the modern political machine, turning it into a monster they believe will be useful to them on the battlefield of the culture war. Netflix's Queen Cleopatra has quickly become the most hated piece of media in recent history, in my lifetime, I have never seen a show, series, documentary, video game, book or album as universally despised as this clumsy, hateful work of distortionist political propaganda. It has a 2% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes from over 5,000 ratings, 1 out of 10 on IMDb from 64,000 ratings, the lowest possible score, and 0.1 on Metacritic, the lowest score possible on that site. The show is so unpopular that professional critics are staying away from it altogether. Usually, they defend historical distortionist works that serve regime narratives. They did, after all, give 94% to The Woman King, a film which claims the abolition of slavery as a cause that originated in Africa. According to the critics, that brutally mediocre slog is as good as The Dark Knight. But only 13 critics rated Queen Cleopatra on Rotten Tomatoes. They know they can't defend this. However much they might like to, they cannot risk what is left of their credibility by siding with this trash against the entire internet, the country of Egypt and thousands of years of history. I cannot in good conscience refer to this show under the name it has appropriated for itself, Queen Cleopatra, and will instead be referring to it as Afro Queen. Firstly, because a big bushy afro is the only hairstyle that this reimagining of Cleopatra has throughout the entire show. The purpose of this hairstyle being to constantly remind the audience of her blackness, just in case they forget during the near four hour runtime of this utter shite. I'm a god. Queen of kings! Secondly, because Afro Queen's main purpose is to Africanize a Greek historical figure and use her as a weapon in the modern West's ongoing culture war. If Cleopatra could be turned, Cleopatra would become a powerful ally. Yes. Cleopatra would be a great asset. The controversy surrounding Afro Queen is by now well known to anyone with access to the internet. But just how historically inaccurate is it? And that aside, is it compelling to watch in any way? Spoiler warning, very and no. Netflix have created a huge brand damaging public humiliation for themselves with Afro Queen, not only by collaborating with extreme far left Afrocentrist historical distortionists to make this tripe, but also just because of the sheer ferocious incompetence of the production. Netflix have thoroughly disgraced themselves with Afro Queen, and I think I can speak for at least the subscribers to this channel in wishing Egyptian lawyer Mahmoud Al Samari success in his lawsuit against Netflix. I hereby bestow upon Mahmoud the honorary title of Caesar Augustus Mahmoud Al Alpha Chad Magnus. Now, before I get laid into Afro Queen, I am pleased to announce a new sponsor for this channel. The Despot will be entering into a partnership with. Netflix. To inaugurate this collaboration, Netflix have decided to debut the trailer for their upcoming docudrama on this channel in this video. Enjoy. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, 
testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The first tactic Afro Queen deploys to set up the lie that Cleopatra was black is obfuscation. They paint a false picture of a highly multiracial Egypt with a vast range of skin colour. It is immediately apparent that not just Cleopatra has been race swapped, the entire country of Egypt has been race swapped. In my last video, I portrayed a race swapped Scotland as part of a Disney remake of Braveheart. And yet, already, here we are, Netflix have race swapped an entire country. Woke media is literally beyond parody at this point. There were three primary populations in Egypt as a whole, Native Egyptians, Native Egyptians, Native Egyptians. Ancient Egyptians would have had a variety of different complexions. Skin color ranged from black to pale brown. Native Egyptians. This is nonsense. Ancient Egypt was not modern Brazil. By the time Cleopatra was born, the ancient pyramids were already ruins. The Egyptians had lived in that land a very long time and had long since bred themselves into an ethnically homogenous people by the time period Afro Queen is set in. Sub-Saharan Africans did not form part of the native Egyptian population. African kingdoms such as Kush did exist far to the south, but Egypt was not an African kingdom in the way this show wants you to believe. Having created a false and biologically impossible narrative of New York City levels of diversity, they have created the setting in which African blood can enter the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty into which Cleopatra was born. They then further confuse the issue by stating, We don't know her exact racial heritage. We don't know who Cleopatra's mother was. It's also uncertain who Cleopatra's grandmother was. We don't know who all of Cleopatra's parents and grandparents were, so one of them must have been black. Despite the fact that she was a Ptolemy and they didn't marry native Egyptians and the Egyptians themselves weren't black. But that's okay because we changed history to make ancient Egyptians black. That is, at best, a historical fantasy set in a fictional alternative history. And yet, it is presented as fact. That is the level of respect Netflix and Jada Pinkett Smith have for their viewers' intelligence. They thought that by lying about the demography of ancient Egypt and deliberately confusing the issue of Cleopatra's descent, they could manipulate people into discarding thousands of years of history and accepting the new Cleopatra, updated for a modern audience. I am a god. Do not disrespect me. And this kind of slimy, deliberate obfuscation goes on throughout the show. Here's an example of semantic wordplay to try to confuse the viewer. She was an African queen. Well, technically, yes. She was born and raised on the continent of Africa. But is that what the talking head means? Or does she mean African in an ethnic sense of the word? The answer is neither. This is an intentional, sleeked conflation of geography and ethnography for political purposes. Also bear in mind that by suggesting the native Egyptian population was black, this show is libeling the Arabs who conquered Egypt, suggesting they committed genocide on a vast scale. The only black population native to Egypt today are the Nubians, who live in the country's deep south. They are a tiny minority. The rest are mostly Arabs and some Copts. So, what happened to all the black people? You know, the Native Egyptians. Well, the obvious inference is that they were exterminated by the Arabs. It's estimated that the Egyptian population was around 5 million at the time of the Arab conquest. Today, the black population native to Egypt is considerably less than 1 million. So, according to Afroqueen, the Arab genocide of native African Egyptians was so brutal that it killed nearly 100% of them. The Germans couldn't even do that in the 40s. They only managed to exterminate two-thirds of Europe's Jews, but Afroqueen wants you to believe that the Egyptian Arabs, and presumably their Coptic collaborators, massacred almost all of Egypt's five million native black inhabitants. Afroqueen is not just an attack on history, it is a blood libel against Egypt, 
All hail Caesar Augustus Mahmud al Alpha Chad Magnus. May the gods march with you on your righteous crusade against Netflix. The show next asserts, quite falsely, that Cleopatra's image is subjective to whoever is depicting her, and thus changeable. In an impressive display of historiographical illiteracy, one of the show's skint intellectuals says the following. The appeal of Cleopatra is that we imagine her. That everyone can imagine her in their own way. No. You do not imagine history. You discover history through extensive, careful research. The parts of history you don't have enough information to know about for sure, you fill in with inference and best guess from evidence that surrounds the part you are filling in. And in any case, we don't need to imagine what Cleopatra looked like. We have contemporary images of her, including coins, sculptures, reliefs, frescoes, and a first century portrait of her from Herculaneum dated to the first century AD. But, shockingly, these images of Cleopatra were not mentioned in Afro Queen. I imagine her to have curly hair like me and a similar skin colour, 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 a similar skin colour. Reflection of myself. The omission of these images alone is enough to condemn this show as worthless pseudo-historical filth with an obvious political agenda and no interest whatsoever in examining real history. The fact that Afro Queen is a work of political activism and not a historical documentary is made clear by the hackademics. Jada Pinkett Smith, the producer of this bald-faced lie, has chosen to include in the panel of Talking Heads. She has gone out of her way to exclude white men from the panel, despite the fact that almost all of the best and most prominent Roman historians are white men, Mary Beard being a notable exception. By the way, anyone interested in actual Roman history should watch Mary Beard's documentaries. The panel in Afro Queen is made up of mostly skin intellectuals, intellectuals whose main qualification is their skin colour. This is not the first time Netflix has done this. Carl Hart was included on the expert panel for a show called Crack, in which he talked about the socio-political history of crack in the United States, despite not being an expert in that area. But he has dark skin and Rastafarian hair, so I guess that qualifies him for a Netflix documentary. Afro Queen has two very obviously politically motivated skin intellectuals. Deborah Hurd, a PhD candidate from the University of Nebraska Omaha. Here is a picture of her proudly sporting a 50 years of black studies t-shirt. And here is the homepage of the University of Nebraska Omaha Black Studies Department. Let's just read the opening paragraph of their welcome message. Dear campus and community family, there is a deep-rooted cancer in this country called white supremacy, which thrives on black slash brown inferiority, so it targets black slash brown people. The entire welcome page is written in that vein, and it gets much, much worse. There's a link to the page in the description if you're feeling unusually masochistic today. Shelley Healy, the Cleopatra was black woman, is, according to her Wikipedia page, an expert in applying black feminist and critical race approaches to the study and teaching of classics. She is a professional historical distortionist. Afro Queen is not panelled by legitimate, well-qualified and experienced historians. I resisted Cleopatra for a really long time in my scholarly life. I said, I am not going to study you. I am not going to study you. It is panelled by political extremists. The next historical inaccuracy I noticed in the show is when it asserts that... Rome is the emerging power? No, it isn't. Rome in 40 BC was the unchallenged master of the Mediterranean. By 50 BC, Caesar had conquered all of Gaul. The only power that could offer any challenge to the Romans was the Parthian Empire, which had very different geopolitical interests to Rome and was not regarded as a long-term threat, though the empires did occasionally war with and cause minor problems for one another. To describe Rome as the emerging power demonstrates an ignorance of the basic history of the period. When the show mentions the Nile, which had to flood every year in order to produce crops, has not flooded at the same level for several years. Now, this isn't Cleopatra's fault. It fails to point out that ancient Egyptians would have regarded a weak Nile flood as a sign that the gods were unhappy with the ruler. Egyptians paid taxes to a class of priests to worship and make sacrifices to the gods on their behalf. If the Nile wasn't flooding, Egyptians would have felt that their taxes were being wasted and the pharaoh was likely to blame. 
blame, but none of this is mentioned. Afro Queen is very short on detail. It has an agenda. If the details can be twisted to serve that agenda, they will be. It's also uncertain who Cleopatra's grandmother was. If they can't, they will be discarded. Reflection of myself. Distortionist gives us our next historical anachronism when she states, So there's a civil war going on in Rome. Once again, it's about power. It's two men. Of course, two men. Women didn't have armies or political power in ancient Rome. Her choice of the word men suggests that a woman might have challenged for power in ancient Rome. And even if this was just a poor word choice, it really does emphasize just how much of a hack this woman is. She doesn't say patrician or general or successful military leader. She says, It's two men. No detail, no historical or political context at all. That is this show's panel in a nutshell. Lazy, inarticulate, no real expertise in the subjects they're discussing. We see reimagined Cleopatra training with the sword when she is in exile in Syria because this 21st century version of Cleopatra is a Mary Sue, yas girl, boss bitch, slay queen. Queen of kings. Excuse me, slay queen of kings. Strong, diverse female character, not being content merely to be a historiographical disgrace with a production quality that would shame a film studies student, this show insists on shoehorning in every modern woke movie trope possible. Mary Sue Boss Bitch Warrior. Emotionally incontinent men. I said do not disturb me! Dad! Evil white man. You should have just taken my offer when you had the chance. Evil racist white man. I'm going to enjoy dragging you through the streets and those bastard half-breeds of yours. Mary Sue boss bitch attacking evil white man. Caesar! Caesar! <laughs> Idiot white man looking to strong, diverse female character for guidance. What am I, Cleopatra? What am I? Men in proximity to Mary Sue turned into morons to make Mary Sue look even more powerful by comparison. Allegiance is to the general. Not you a. will do well to remember what I bring to the table. Oh, you did. Talk to me like- The, if you disagree with any of this, you're a racist, fourth wall break. She was an African queen. And that's a fact that's been buried, erased, whitewashed. As much as Afro Queen is Afrocentrist bilge, it's also a feminist power fantasy. Much as the Woman King was a feminist power fantasy, see this scene of a 56-year-old Viola Davis holding her own against a guy who looks like a heavyweight boxer. <laughs> The only thing missing from reimagined Cleopatra's warrior slay queen scene is a lightsaber lesson from Mary Sue Palpatine. There is not a single scene in this docuseries that features only men speaking with one another. This is the ancient Roman world. Egypt was a client state of Rome. Mark Antony and Octavian were the two most powerful men in the Roman triumvirate, which divided the empire into jurisdictions ruled over by Octavian in the west and Antony in the east, and Lepidus in west North Africa, but he was a minor player. The two main triumvirs, Antony and Octavian, met regularly and held peace conferences to extend the triumvirate as an alternative to civil war. Cleopatra was politically invested in all of this and would have had spies in both Octavian and Antony's camps, and almost certainly acted as a political advisor to Antony as she was more politically astute than he was. But none of this is even mentioned in Afro Queen. None of it serves the show's purpose of deifying Cleopatra as a feminist messiah and African Queen version of the Mary Sue character that infests so much of modern media. And let's just speak plainly here. The show's producers, Pinkett Smith and whoever else she managed to break out of hell to make this show with her are anti-white racists. History be damned, they aren't going to have scenes featuring white men talking to each other in their show. The most offensive historical inaccuracy for me personally was the fact that Caesar was hair swapped. He was given a full head of hair. This is one of the great bald men of history, and as a bald man myself, I needed him to be bald so that I could see a reflection of myself reflected back at myself. When I look at Jada Pinkett Smith, I can see a reflection of myself. Reflection of myself. But when they hair swapped Caesar, they took away my ability to see myself in Afro Queen. For that reason, I will be referring to the Caesar caricature in this show as not my Caesar. There is also no mention of the fact that Caesar saved Cleopatra. 
Cleopatra's brother, Ptolemy XIII, raised an army of almost 30,000 Egyptians and mercenaries and besieged Caesar and 4,000 Roman soldiers inside an area of Alexandria. This siege lasted six months. In the end, Caesar managed to get reinforcements to Egypt, which forced Ptolemy to abandon the siege. Caesar then joined the reinforcements with his own army and crushed Ptolemy's much larger army. Neither the siege nor Caesar's victory is mentioned in Afroqueen. The show describes this war as if it was an entirely Egyptian Egyptian affair that was won by Cleopatra and Cleopatra alone. It does this by describing the war briefly and in extremely vague terms. Afro Queen appropriates Caesar's victory and gives it to their updated Cleopatra because it does not want to mention male achievement. Any achievement in this show must be attributed to reimagined Cleopatra. Another very important reason Afro Queen refuses to mention Caesar's rescue of Cleopatra is that. In modern content, a woman can never be saved by a man, and if history disobeys this current year era rule, then history will have to be updated for a modern audience. Afro Queen suggests that Cleopatra was a sovereign ruler of an independent state that was in a voluntary alliance with Rome, when in reality Cleopatra was a puppet queen placed in power by Caesar following his destruction of her internal political and military enemies. But even before Cleopatra was born, Egypt was already under Roman in control and only nominally independent. Rome didn't annex Egypt as a province because they would have had to kill the entire Ptolemaic dynasty to do so, which they didn't want to do because the Ptolemies owed Rome a massive amount of money. The Romans also didn't want to have to deal with an uprising in Egypt that would inevitably follow the abolition of the Egyptian royal family. And being pragmatists, the Romans knew that if it's not broken, don't fix it. Egypt was immensely wealthy and Rome was profiting from this wealth. There was no good political or economic reason for Rome to turn Egypt into a province, which is why they instead chose to retain it as a puppet kingdom. But Afro Queen, unsurprisingly, mentions none of this. In the alternate Slay Queen version of history that Afro Queen inhabits, Cleopatra was the powerful ruler of an independent African kingdom, and the mighty woman king bowed to no man. And if history says otherwise, then fuck history. The regime decides history now. Not the historical sources, not 100 million Egyptian racists, the regime will tell Egypt what their history is. The erasure of achievement in reimagined Cleopatra's male contemporaries is not limited to Not My Caesar. We see the same treatment with Mr. Cleopatra, this show's version of Mark Antony and Moctavian. Neither Mr. Cleopatra Do not disturb me! nor Moctavian Get him out of now! are intended as honest attempts to portray historical figures. Like reimagined Cleopatra, Mr. Cleopatra and Moctavian are caricaturist inserts. The reimagined Cleopatra character is intended to portray the historical figure as an African queen of deific genius, whose downfall was entirely the result of the male incompetence she was surrounded by. Not My Caesar, Mr. Cleopatra and Moctavian are intended as mockeries and diminutions of the historical figures under whose name they are marinated around the set of this diabolical abomination. Just as there is no mention of Caesar's conquest of Egypt, Antony's military achievements are also omitted. When discussing Antony's invasion of Parthia, Afro Queen describes it thus. The Parthians defeat Mark Antony. It's a disastrous campaign from Mark Antony. He loses thousands of men. There is no mention of the fact that Antony led a very difficult and successful retreat from Parthia, holding his army together when it could easily have fallen apart from desertion and guerrilla attack under a lesser leader. A general who was able to keep his cool under severe pressure, hold his army together and carry out a successful retreat in the face of constant enemy harassment is swapped out and replaced with this. I said, do not disturb me! Don't! Cleopatra. <sighs> Nothing is working. That hairless little prick is trumping my every move, all of them. Nor is there any mention of Antony's conquest of Armenia in the aftermath of the campaign, during which he captured the Armenian king who had betrayed him. This was followed by Antony's triumph in Alexandria, but making the viewer aware of any of this entails the danger of allowing Antony to look good, of depicting him for what he was, a very capable general and strong leader. Instead, Afro Queen decides to depict Antony as just another white male incompetent, buzzing uselessly around the immaculate African Queen. 
and mentioning that Anthony returned to Alexandria in triumph, literally, would deprive the show of inserting this fictional scene into history. Act like you know what you are. What am I, Cleopatra? What am I? You are a warrior. The defeated, emotionally incontinent, useless, drunken idiot white man must be held together by the strong, powerful African queen, and apparently the man who conquered Gaul alongside Julius Caesar, then vanquished Caesar's assassins in another war, needs to be reminded by a melanated sister, in the words of Afro Queen's director, of his martial abilities. You are a warrior. This reimagined version of history is much more suited to modern audiences and fits nicely with this show's approach to history, discarding all facts that have no political utility. In a scene showing reimagined giving birth, Jada Pinkett Smith's voice asserts the following. Women must face dangers no man ever will. Yeah, never mind the 20,000 Roman men who fought and risked death to save Cleopatra's life and throne, or the 30,000 men who were just annihilated on the other side of that political dispute. The only people facing any real danger in this world are the women. Also, is this documentary suggesting that men can't give birth? Birthing persons must face dangers no man ever will. That's better. By the way, the Julian calendar is black now. Julius Caesar also adjusts the Roman calendar. The ancient Egyptians were consummate astronomers, and they had created a very effective solar-based calendar. The origin of our calendar, and the one that Julius Caesar adopts when Cleopatra visits Rome. Here is a brief explanation of why we was the Julian calendar is, in fact, another Afrocentrist invention manufactured by this show. The Julian calendar had nothing to do with Cleopatra. Caesar enlisted the help of a Greek, Sosigenes of Alexandria. The subsequent Julian calendar they came up with was based on the Greek 365-day calendar, but altered. Some months were given 31 days at February's expense, because February was the month dedicated to the worship of underworld gods, and February was given an additional day every four years. It wasn't a copy of the Egyptian calendar, which had 12 12 months of 30 days and 5 others to be added manually. But Afro Queen has decided that none of that happened so the Julian calendar can be African. Also bear in mind that there is not a trace of historical evidence that Caesar consulted Cleopatra during the formation of the Julian calendar. This is simply a lie spun from whole cloth by the creators of this show. The show does mention the donations of Alexandria in which Antony gifted Roman lands to Cleopatra, which were given at Antony's triumph in Alexandria, but manages to omit the triumph itself. This is how Octavian's reaction to the donations is described in the show. You know that emoji where the head explodes? That's Octavian when he hears about the donations of, of Alexandria. No, Octavian was aware that a civil war between him and Antony was inevitable. The donations were practically irrelevant to him because he had no access to Antony's triumviral lands and the Roman Senate rejected the donations, asserting Roman sovereignty over those lands. What the donations of Alexandria did give Octavian was a massive boost to his propaganda campaign against Antony and a casus belli to declare war. Octavian would have been delighted when he heard about the donations of Alexandria, but an accurate depiction of Octavian's political genius would interfere with this show's determination to depict every white male as a moron incapable of controlling himself. Get him out of here now! Who do you think you are, Cleopatra? Who did this? Following Octavian's declaration of war, we get this scene. Octavian's mistake is how much he underestimates us. This exchange suggests that Antony and Cleopatra were underdogs, when in fact Octavian was the underdog. The Eastern Empire, particularly the Roman client kingdom of Egypt, was considerably more wealthy than the West. Antony had a massive army and navy and the money to pay for it. Octavian had bled the Roman people dry through taxation to pay for his army and navy, which made him unpopular and had caused massive riots. He was in enormous debt to his soldiers, had a smaller and less experienced army than Antony, and, by his own admission, was not a good general. The odds favoured Antony, not Octavian, but this show needs an excuse for why the powerful African Queen of Kings lost to a clueless white man, so they falsely portray her as the underdog. Afro Queen's description of the Battle of Actium is not so much historically inaccurate as it is a holocaust of truth. This show has a narrative that Cleopatra was an unassailably brilliant African queen, and so it has brutally twisted the Battle of Actium to fit that narrative. They begin with this. In 31 BCE, Cleopatra and Mark Antony go head-to-head -head in 
all-out naval warfare with Octavian. The reality is that the Battle of Actium was the final desperate act, probably a breakout attempt by Antony, following a series of smaller battles and defections during the Actium War, all of which Octavian and Agrippa had won. By the way, Agrippa, Octavian's brilliant admiral and the architect of Octavian's victory over Antony, was not mentioned in this show. But an all-out battle allows this show to avoid mentioning Agrippa because white male achievement bad. And more importantly, to avoid explaining why this sublime African Queen's Navy was repeatedly defeated by Agrippa prior to it being blockaded at Actium. Afro Queen also asserts that This doesn't sit well with all of Antony's generals, some of whom don't want to take orders from a woman. This is a lie. Plain and simple, Cleopatra was not giving commands during the War of Actium. The Roman generals are depicted as morons who allow their fragile male egos to get in the way of military affairs. In reality, the Roman generals didn't want Cleopatra there because they felt it would demoralize the Roman soldiers in their army and encourage them to defect to Octavian, which is exactly what happened. Cleopatra's presence also allowed Octavian to portray the war not as a Roman civil war, but as an eastern invasion, which would make the Roman people much more willing to tolerate the heavy taxation that had been imposed on them by Octavian to pay for the war. The main reason Cleopatra was there is because she was paying for Antony's war, and most of the troops in Antony's army were easterners, not Romans, and her presence was a strong moral boost for them. But all things considered, and with the benefit of hindsight, Antony would probably have been better off if he had left Cleopatra in Egypt. So, as it turned out, the Roman generals that didn't want Cleopatra there were probably right. However, you will be shocked to learn that Afro Queen does not see fit to mention any of this. By the way, when Mr. Cleopatra steps in to put these out of control, sexist generals in their place. What I think you meant to say was, thank you, Isis, for providing us with the world's most invincible naval fleet. Afro Queen reminds us that reimagined Cleopatra didn't need no man. Thank you, but I had it. You got this shit, bro. Once the battle begins... What do you mean, once the battle begins? The War of Actium was already lost by this stage. This was a breakout attempt, not a decisive battle. And how exactly did Antony and Cleopatra's navy end up in this extremely unfavourable position, bottled up in port with their enemies impeding their exit? This show doesn't see fit to relate that information. Next, we learn about... Cleopatra and Mark Antony both made a series of problematic battle decisions. Firstly, this is Orwellian language. She can't say military blunders because reimagined Cleopatra is in command here, and she doesn't make military blunders, but there could be some... problematic battle decisions... happening around her. Also, Antony found himself in this position not due to battle decisions he made. Antony hadn't fought a battle at this stage. His admirals had been defeated several times at sea, and Agrippa had defeated a garrison at Methoni, an important port of logistical supply for Antony, but Antony had not himself been present during any of these defeats. The reason Antony and Cleopatra found themselves in this position is because of strategic blunders they made. They arrived in Greece with a massive army that depended on a long supply route. Octavian avoided battle with the army, and Agrippa destroyed the supply route and bases of logistical support with his navy. It was not problematic battle decisions that landed Antony and Cleopatra in this mess. It was bad strategy. The breakout, which is mischaracterized by Afro Queen as a single decisive battle, was reasonably successful. Both Antony and Cleopatra escaped along with their war chest and perhaps a third of their warships. This was a decent result given that before the breakout they were in danger of total defeat. During the breakout attempt, we are treated to Girl Boss Reimagined shouting orders at her rowers. <laughs> This is a particularly stupid lie. A woman the size of Reimagined would not be audible in the midst of this level of noise. The only voice that would carry would be that of a big, burly, angry Viking. And I don't care that Vikings did not exist at this point in history. A berserker shouting orders on this rowing ship would still be more historically accurate than this. <laughs> The show asserts that Cleopatra fled the battle in order to protect what is mine. 
and characterize it thus. It might have actually been the best decision even for Mark Antony. It was the right decision. I did what I had to do. I did what I had to do to protect what is mine. Cleopatra's thinking about herself and her own power. She's putting herself and her family first. I made a decision and I stand by it. Her primary goal remains the safety of her own kingdom, the safety of Egypt. She has no choice. While Antony's retreat is described as an act of cowardice. Antony, knowing the battle is all but lost, flees and manages to catch up to Cleopatra's fleet. The powerful African queen did what I had to do to protect what is mine. While the cowardly white man flees. This in spite of the fact that they both did the exact same thing, retreated from a battle they could not win. According to this show, Cleopatra made the unilateral decision to retreat to Egypt and Antony fled after her, like a dog running after its master. Wait for me, sir. <laughs> Let's just consult the Wikipedia page on the battle before it too is updated for a modern audience. Karen iPhone, if you would. Seeing that the battle was going against Antony, Cleopatra decided to follow Antony's original orders and took her squadron of ships and tried to penetrate Octavian's center. As a gap opened in Agrippa's blockade, she funneled through. Antony then issued orders for his entire fleet to break through Octavian's lines. Antony led the breakthrough and his spearhead was able to penetrate Octavian's center. However, shortly after Antony's breakthrough, Agrippa ordered his flanks to attack the rest of Antony's ships from both sides. Antony and Cleopatra could only watch on helplessly as their fleet once the largest in Roman history, was destroyed. The couple was forced to take their remaining 90 ships and retreat to Alexandria. But describing the battle as it actually happened interferes with the narrative. Much better to have Mr. Cleopatra argue petulantly with the real head of the family. And you should have asked me first. I'm the general, not you. How dare you? How dare you? You cut me out. If Antony had a ship for every historical inaccuracy in Afro Queen's description of the War of Actium, he would have won the war. Up to this point, Afro Queen has taken a wrecking ball approach to history, but with its treatment of Augustus, the first Roman emperor, who at the time of Afro Queen's setting was known only by his given name, Octavian, the show takes what can only be described as a torture chamber approach to history. The depiction of Octavian is nothing short of character assassination. Before I get into Afro Queen's treatment of Octavian, here are just some of that great man's achievements. He brought Rome's period of civil wars to an end and transformed a decaying republic into a thriving empire. He founded the Pax Romana, a period of relative peace which lasted 200 years. He repaired and rebuilt temples throughout the empire, lifting the morale of the people and reviving the spirit of Rome. He ended arbitrary taxation, which had caused resentment among taxpayers and encouraged riots and even revolts. Augustus imposed consistent, direct taxation on the provinces of the empire. This financial system was far more effective than any implemented before. This fair, consistent and predictable taxation greatly increased Rome's net revenue and helped to pacify the empire's populace and stabilize the economy. He abolished tax farming, that is, he made it illegal for the Roman government to sell taxation rights to private individuals, who would then often brutally abuse those rights for personal enrichment. The tax barons were replaced with a salaried civil service. He improved the reliability and quality of Rome's currency, which led to a huge increase in trade, enriching the empire at all levels of the socio-economic hierarchy. He expanded Rome's road network, built aqueducts including the Aqua Giulio and the Aqua Virgo, and overseen the construction of the Temple of Caesar, Temple of Apollo Palatinus, the Forum of Augustus, the Temple of Mars Ultor, Baths of Agrippa, Arch of Augustus and the Arapassus, an altar dedicated to Pax, the Roman goddess of peace. He secured order in Rome with the introduction of a police force and a firefighting service. He significantly expanded the territory of the Roman Empire, annexing Egypt as a province and conquering or subjugating northern Spain, North Africa, Asia Minor, Thrace, Central Europe, the Holy Lands and the Black Sea coast. Augustus is regarded as perhaps the greatest of Roman emperors and one of the great leaders of history. This is how Caesar Augustus, founder of the Pax Romana and first emperor of the Roman Empire, is depicted in Afro Queen. Looks like your African sorcery failed you this time, Pharaoh. Your witchcraft must be very strong to turn two great sons of Rome against their own. What are you smiling about? Witch? You're a lot shorter 
than I thought you'd be. Your children look just like you. Especially your eldest. You should have just taken my offer when you had the chance. I'm going to enjoy dragging you through the streets. And those bastard half-breeds of yours, they're going to watch. Get him out of here now! They chose an ugly little man to play Octavian. He is short-tempered, emotionally incontinent, squeaky-voiced, prickly, evil, racist, sadistic, angry, and pathetic. And just in case the audience doesn't get the message that Octavian is a wretched, wicked little creature to be scoffed at, Reimagined reminds us with this line. You're a lot shorter than I thought you'd be. Despite the fact that this line makes no sense, Cleopatra would have known exactly how tall Octavian was from descriptions she would have heard and read of him, and may even have met him in person during one of her trips to Rome. And also, is this show suggesting that short stature is something to be laughed at? Should we all just be laughing at dwarves because they're so small? They're trying to depict Cleopatra as noble and clever here, but she just comes off sounding like a juvenile pathetic bully. Afro Queen's character assassination of Octavian is entirely politically motivated. White man evil, strong, powerful, defiant, girl boss, African queen, good. She doesn't crumple at that point. And how exactly do you know what her emotional state was at this point? I remember my grandmother saying to me, Forget it. Rome tapped the bank of Egypt and impoverished it. I, I fucking can't even, man. Karen, iPhone, help me out here, please. For the first century following the Roman conquest, Egypt functioned in the Mediterranean world as an active and prosperous Roman province. The value of Egypt to the Romans was considerable as revenues from the country were almost equal to those from Gaul and more than 12 times those from Judea. Its wealth was largely agricultural. Egyptian grain supplied the city of Rome. The country also produced papyrus, glass, and various finely crafted minor arts that were exported to the rest of the Roman Empire. Trade with Central Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and India flourished along the Nile, desert routes, and sea routes from the Red Sea port of Berenike. Goods and cultural influences flowed from Egypt to Rome through Alexandria, which Diodorus of Sicily described as the first city of the civilized world in the first century BC. Its great library and community of writers, philosophers, and scientists were known throughout the ancient world. Impoverished it. Egypt functioned in the Mediterranean world as an active and prosperous Roman province. Impoverished it. This show has a current year political narrative to push evil white colonizers oppressing the native African inhabitants of this African country and brutally exploiting them. And if history says otherwise, then history can go f impoverished it. They even show an image of the ruin of the Sphinx when one of the talking heads is relating the impoverishment of Egypt. The Sphinx and the pyramids were already ruins when Alexander conquered Egypt 300 years before. That is how profoundly old they are. But Afro Queen chooses to anachronistically shoehorn in an image of the desiccated Sphinx as if to suggest that it was Roman exploitation that led to its demise. Disgusting and deliberate vandalization of history for political purposes. Cleopatra is framed as this great seductress, as a temptress, drunk witch. It's misogynistic and it's xenophobic. This coming from an unqualified idiot who collaborates with Afrocentrist extremists to manufacture a lie about an ancient Greek queen's life and identity in order to turn her into a tool of modern political propaganda because white people bad. Oh, and 100 million Egyptians also bad. They're xenophobic. But they're an afterthought. When it comes to my people, we seem to be erased. Xenophobic. Misogynistic. Xenophobic. Misogynistic. Xenophobic. And idiot's criticism is anachronistic. You cannot deploy slurs that were invented five minutes ago for usage in a contemporary information war as libels against ancient people who lived in a profoundly different world with a profoundly different understanding of morality, religion and society. Calling ancient Romans xenophobic would be like calling Jesus demonophobic for expelling legion from the man they inhabited. I use they and them as my pronouns. We next get some girl boss moments from Reimagined. She sends a 
I'm off to the next battle. Apparently, Cleopatra was the supreme military commander of Antony's forces, and Antony's was hers to command. This isn't true, but to hell with truth, I suppose, because girl power. She sends him off to the next battle. By the way, this is wrong. Antony won a small engagement close to Alexandria. The next battle was the siege of Alexandria itself. Regarding Antony's suicide... Mark Antony has attempted to commit suicide after receiving a note from Cleopatra. We don't know what was in that note. Shakespeare would have us believe Cleopatra fabricated her own suicide. Ah yes, Shakespeare, that white male hack, author of such trash as Macbeth, King Lear, The Tempest and Hamlet. We shouldn't believe anything he wrote. We should believe the professional distortionist, author of such great and renowned works as Black Feminist Thought and Classics, Remembering, Reclaiming, Reempowering. Be not afraid of the dark, critical race theory and classical studies, scientific racism, representing reality, provincial women as tools of Roman social reproduction, and when I enter, disrupting the white heteronormative narrative of librarianship. Truly timeless works that would have caused Cicero himself to weep with envy. At last, someone who has bested Cicero. <laughs> By the way, distortionist, how is it that you know the exact details of Antony's death? My grandmother. Forget I asked. Let's just move on. Cleopatra is probably feeling defiant. How do you know this? She killed herself days later, so it's fair to assume that she was at the very least feeling somewhat despondent. I am loathed to ask, but what source did you consult that related Cleopatra's behavioural comportment at this time? My grandmother. We are next informed of the brilliant, complex Byzantine plot hatched by Cleopatra. She has a plan. Cleopatra always has a plan. Killing yourself isn't a plan. Plan suggests difficult and complex prior organisation. Suicide does not require these things. Suicide is a final act, not a game of 40 interdimensional chess. She decides how she's going to die. No, she chooses from a very limited range of options, limited due to the fact that she has been utterly vanquished by Octavian and Agrippa. She is in control. No, she isn't. That's the point. That's why she's killing herself, because she has lost all control. Her kingdom has been conquered by Octavian. Antony is dead, her children's lives and her life are in the hands of Octavian. She has less control over her own life than a common peasant. Her granddaughter marries into the Roman imperial family. We was the Roman emperors, also we was the pyramids, the Sphinx, the Egyptians, Cleopatra and the Julian calendar. She has become an icon. That statement is the only part of this calamity that is true, but not in the way the talking head intends. Reimagined Cleopatra, the one-dimensional feminist messiah character of this show, has become an icon, a symbol of woke Hollywood's intellectual depravity, cultural imperialism, historical revisionism, vicious racialization of everything, of their anti-Western, anti-white agenda and their complete disdain for anyone that opposes them, be it what they would term a toxic fandom or a nation of over 100 million people. When, in the near future, race swaps have become unfashionable and are looked upon with universal disgust, Afro Queen will be an iconic symbol of that dark period of American culture history. I resisted Cleopatra for a really long time. I said, I am not going to study you. I'm not going to study you. Yes, your ignorance of Cleopatra has been made clear throughout the course of this historiographical apocalypse. She was an African queen. That's a fact that's been buried, erased, whitewashed. Buried, erased, whitewashed. Now, if that isn't the activist hack skintellectual calling the Greek queen black... Afro Queen has absolutely bombed. It peaked at number four on Netflix and fell out of the top 10 within five days of its release, which is an utterly pathetic performance. And although its failure is financially meaningless, the production budget could not possibly have exceeded $200, it is a well-deserved humiliation for Netflix and for Jada Pinkett Smith. The creators of Afro Queen have spat upon the story of Cleopatra by reducing her to a blackwashed prop in a culture war. They declared war on history, determined to turn Egyptian history into an Afrocentrist colony, 
and they lost. They lost so supremely that even the critics, the same establishment punks that rallied around the woman king, didn't come out for Afro Queen because they knew that it was a lost cause. It is not an exaggeration to say that the rejection of Netflix's cultural distortion has been universal. It has been met with, to use the official metric of Metacritic, overwhelming dislike. And that's putting it very mildly. Watching Jada Pinkett Smith and Netflix being publicly humiliated for their assault on history has been a true pleasure to watch. If ever a show deserved to feel, it was Afro Queen. Glory to everyone who rejected Afro Queen. Glory to Rome and glory to Caesar Augustus Mahmoud Al Alpha Chad Magnus. Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget to blackwash the like button.